In light of the recent events of the past couple of weeks, we really especially wanted to talk to you. The events that I'm referring to are that friend of the show, Nathan J. Robinson, uh, founder of Current Affairs Magazine, got into hot water with The Guardian for a couple of tweets, and they terminated his um, contract uh, for tweets that they deemed to be anti-Semitic. Obviously, this is perceived by the left as part and parcel of a broader trend where uh, criticism of U.S. foreign policy toward Israel seems to be bracketed, separated and apart as something that's worth condemnation and outside of this whole cancel, cancel culture free speech issue, and that there's still a certain level of risk involved in making those kinds of critiques. Mark, you've experienced this firsthand. So we wanted to open this conversation about why the left doesn't talk more forcefully about these issues. But to first start with getting a little bit of background uh, on the book and the project that you guys are working on together. So what what is the thesis? What are you writing about in this one? Well, you know, we uh, are very much interested in all the issues you're talking about and trying to get at a, a real solid answer to this question of how is it that the left, and I'm using left in quotes, uh, there are competing ideas about what constitutes the left. There are, there are people who are liberal Democrats who say they're the left. There are people who, are, who identify as progressives. There are people who are radicals. And we may have disagreements on what constitutes the left, but all those folk oftentimes will articulate a set of values, a worldview, uh, a, a set of uh, ideals, uh, that are fairly consistent and steady. And then when the question of Palestine comes up, somehow those things fall short. It's one thing to say that people are afraid. It's one thing to say that people don't know enough about the issue. All, both of those things are true, mm -hmm. but at, sometimes. Uh, other times, it seems like there's an inconsistency that is much more challenging to account for. And so what we want to do in the book is figure out sort of how do we get to a place where people are... Uh, as we say in the activist community, PEPs, progressive except for Palestine. Hmm. And what are some of the forces, some of the structures, some of the laws, some of the norms, some of the you know cultural practices within American politics that normalize that? At our best, I think we do that by when we're highlighting you know key issues where we see those contradictions. And I, I let Mitchell talk about some of these things. But like I, I give you one you know sort of quick example when we're talking about uh, the boycott, boycott, divestment, and sanctions movement. And you have someone like a uh, a Cory Booker, right? Mm -hmm. Who would identify as a progressive, right? I, you know, he would say, you know, oh my God. He, in fact, no, no, not he would say. He has said, right? Yeah. We need to fight uh, to make sure that that American companies can live out their values and exercise their values and not be sort of challenged by by these popular boycotts. He was saying that specifically in response to an attempt to. Uh, uh, you, you know, this kind of growing discourse around criminalizing BDS, around challenging people who, who oppose BDS, even in some states like Texas, you know, you, you, there'll be people who are applying for school district jobs and, and they have to sign waivers in, in order to get jobs. All this stuff is part of the backdrop. So when uh, Cory Booker says that, it's like, OK, that doesn't seem very progressive. But when you look at but when you ask yourself, would he say that about Hobby Lobby? Would he say that about Chick-fil-A? Would he say that about Walmart? The answer is hell no. Would he so, would he object to boycotts of those things? Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. And, and not only would he not, he may even join them and take photos of himself there. Uh, yeah. So what's different about this? And and lastly, what I'll say uh, is because I don't want to feel like there's this there's this implicit thing that's hanging that 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 I'm that I'm not saying for some reason for some nefarious reason. This is not a a, a conspiracy. This is not a, a cabal of Jewish power. This is not any of those anti-Semitic tropes that too often. Uh, loom large in these conversations, and they should not. They need, must be dismantled. Uh, it's about how American politics works, and and it's and, and we're trying to wrestle with that stuff. Mitchell, I, I want to ask you, what what is there? What what is the argument for why BDS is different? The people who are framing BDS as um, something to be um, criminalized. Um, something that is kind of a, a, an act of hate, uh, a hate movement, all of the kind of rhetoric that you hear about it. What is their good faith argument for that? And what should people understand about the origins of the movement and kind of what what it really is? 
I, I think I think one of the things that is important to consider when we're looking at this, right? The first, almost every argument uh, that demonizes criticism of Israel, that that attack, whether it's BDS or, or something else, what uh, any kind of criticism of Israel, the the first part of that argument is always, well, Israel is the only Jewish state, and it's getting singled out and it's getting attacked in this way, um, and that. Is so that that is something that immediately puts people on the defensive. I I, I want to uh, so years ago, just just actually just before I met Mark, um, I was working at the Foundation for Middle East Peace. I was the vice president. The president at that time was Matt Duss, who is currently uh, Bernie Sanders' foreign policy advisor. And Matt one day was um, was called to testify at a House uh, subcommittee hearing about, actually about BDS. And before Matt could even get through his testimony, a Republican senator uh, who's, uh, I'm sorry, a representative who, uh, forgetting his name, Russell, I believe his name was, uh, he was from Oklahoma, he's no longer in Congress, um, basically tore into Matt based on a a scurrilous article that a right-wing newspaper had written about his family. So he was attacking Matt's father. He was attacking Matt's brother uh, and, and also Matt himself. And I'm watching this on C-SPAN and I, my chin just hit the floor. Uh, basically, uh, Stephen, is that Stephen Russell? Yes, that was Stephen Russell, right? And um, uh, he, he basically was saying, you're, you're an entire family of anti-Semites. And then he said, I have nothing to hear from you and got up and left the hearing. I called some folks, friends of mine who had been working in Washington for many, many years, not just on this issue, and no one had ever seen anything like it. Mm-hmm. Um, it was it was unprecedented. It was unheard of. I mean, and, and it was something I think straight out of, you know, I think you'd have to go back to the McCarthy hearings. So this scares people. Right. And it becomes also a very powerful weapon. Um, I think I think if you want to argue against BDS, you can you can argue against any boycott movement. You know, I, I am old enough to, uh, to remember, you know, I, I was in my twenties in the 1980s in the Reagan years. And um, I remember the arguments against boycotting South Africa. Hmm. Um, and they were, they, they were many, they were not quite this, they were not exactly the same ones that you hear now about Israel. But, you know, we look back now and, and we ask, how could you possibly argue against that? Even conservatives wouldn't try to make that argument anymore. That fight has been lost. But, you know, people, you can make those arguments. And I think it's, you know, I may disagree. I may even think it's, it's uh, bigoted, but, but you can legitimately make those arguments. Yet, they're not trying to. And the reason I feel like the opposition to BDS, rather than uh, attack, you know, making an argument about why Israel should not be boycotted, attacks the movement and the people behind it, is because um, they, they, that is just a much more effective argument because if, if you try and actually attack the reasons for BDS and the idea of BDS and defend Israel, you have to defend Israeli policies, which mm-hmm. deny people's rights. Um, and of course, the other part of that is you also get to a point where, uh, you know, very quickly in these arguments, it immediately becomes about you want to destroy Israel, you want to kill all the Jews in Israel, you want to do, you know, all of these horrible, horrible uh, things that bring up terrible uh, images in people's heads. And that's actually not true. What we're, what this movement is about, and, and certainly there's a lot of angry rhetoric, and it's not limited to the pro-Israel side at all. Uh, but this, the BDS movement, again, oppose it or support it, but it's about Palestinian rights. It's not about, uh, you know, framing the argument as being anti-Israel. It's not anti-Israel unless you believe that the basic civil and human rights of Palestinians is by definition anti-Israel. And I reject that. Um, I, I do not think that uh, that that the rights of Palestinians need to be can only happen at the expense of the rights of Israeli people. But certainly, yes, Palestinian rights have to be achieved through some major changes to the way Israel does business. So one of the. You know, framing ideas that you interrogate at the start of the book is the way that this notion of, you know, this question of, you know, 
does Israel have a right to exist ends up being kind of a, an initial question that starts all of these arguments in this kind of defensive territory. And you walk through this history of folks, um, you know, Zionists, including Zionists who said, well, I, why do I even have to defend that? You know, it's like, by even making me ask that question or talking about it in that way, you're kind of presuming there's a world in which Israel shouldn't exist. And I think of that of that as a disempowering statement. But now the it, it feels to be the predominant view is that by putting out there, um, you know, it's starting with the question, you know, does, you know, it, it acknowledge Israel has a right to exist. You know, it presumes that there are people who don't and that the fight is about this kind of existential issue as opposed to centering a conversation about Palestinian rights separate and apart as though it's not a zero sum game. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, I mean, there's a, there's a lot of layers to this. So I'll, I'll take a, a slice of part of it. Um, I mean, the first question is, what does it mean for a, a, a nation state to have a right to exist? That's the first question, mm -hmm. right? Do do states have a right to exist in general? Not not Israel in, in, in particular, because I think if we only isolate Israel, if we only spotlight Israel, that's a very different and somewhat dangerous territory to enter. Mm -hmm. But but if we ask a broader philosophical question, which is, does do states have a right to exist or do or rather do people have a right to exist? I think we have a, a particular, a different question. And then the second question is, do people, do states have a right to exist in a certain way? For example, do we have the right to re exist as a republic? Does, uh, you know, th does, does Saudi Arabia or Iran have a right to exist in its particular sort of um, uh, formation, right? Is, is, you know, what does it mean to be a constitutional monarch monarchy? What does it mean to be a Jordanian state, right? Do, do they have a right to exist in those forms or do they have a right, when we say that, are, are we talking about respecting their territorial integrity and their sovereignty, right? Those are different questions. Uh, the other piece is who gets asked this question, mm -hmm. right? The state of Israel is not on a regular basis asking uh, uh, Switzerland to affirm its right to exist or asking uh, the United States to affirm its rights to, to exist. It's, it's a question largely placed squarely at, on the shoulders of and at the laps of Palestinians. Mm -hmm. And again, if you're asking, do Israelis have a right to exist? I would say absolutely. They uh, uh, Israelis, uh, uh, Arabs, Palestinians, Jordanians, Lib Libyans, Liberians, South Africans, Mexicans, whoever, we all have a right to exist in peace, dignity, safety, uh, freedom and self-determination. And, and, and our Jewish brothers and sisters are no exception to that question. But the question becomes really, when people say a right to exist, what are they talking about? They're talking about the right to exist as a Jewish state. And the question becomes, another question then becomes, well, do you have a right to exist in that form? And what's at, what's at stake when you do? Um, for some, it's a question of Jewish self-determination. And I, again, I think Jewish people, like all people, have a right to self-determination. Well, that, that phrase is is lobbied about, around a, a lot. What 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 is meant by that? Well, that, that, that's just that's just it. That, that's, that, that's, that is the right question. That is the perfect question. And in many ways, that's why we say in the book, this then becomes a referendum or at least a, 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 an analysis or d demands an analysis of Zionism. Because as, as, as a political project, as an ideological project, sometimes as a religious project. But the question is, when people say we have a right to exist with they, or a right to self-determination and in this particular iteration of Zionism, right, political Zionism, which has been the dominant iteration of Zionism, there's been all, there are all sorts of Zionists, there's Peter Beinart, the, the cultural Zionist, there are, there are liberal Zionists out there. But the dominant iteration of Zionism has been the, the settler colonial project of political Zionism that has emer that emerges and really begins at the end of the 19th century. Uh, with the first Aliyah and 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 continues throughout this the, the 21st century, and that project that that issue of self determination has often been conflated not just with uh, uh, creating a Jewish nation right a, a kind of form of Jewish nationalism, uh, but it's also been connected to uh, the belief in uh, form, forming a state and a state where there is already an indigenous population there. Now, again, I'm not saying that there's not a Jewish presence in historic Palestine. There is and there always has been long before 1882, long before the first Aliyah, long before the World Zionist Conference, uh, con you know, con conventions, its conference, excuse me, it, uh, all of that. Right. But when we're talking about the major immigration into historic Palestine throughout the late 19th and, and, and then throughout the 20th century, we're or, yeah, 20th century, we're talking about not just. Uh, a a self-determination in the sense that we can define our own identity and we can live in a, in a, in a state of our own people, but it's also a, a formation and a political project that is impinged on the rights of other people who are there. So, so when we talk about self-determination, that becomes, um, a, again, a very complicated and fraught question. <laughs> 